So growing up in our home, Christmas was the biggest celebration of the year. My mother was vehemently against religion. And I said, God, look, if you're there, I said, if you're there and you want me, I said, I will, I will give up all of the haram in my life for one month. He came down. I said, what? I said, what, what? He goes, yeah. I said, what, what, yeah? Because yeah, but she gave shahada. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi everyone. Welcome back to the Ilm Feed podcast. It's your host Shabir Hassan. Alhamdulillah. Today we were joined by Brother Raheem Jung. Uh, SubhanAllah, you know, we heard about his personal story, his background, where he came from, uh, the Islam of some of his family members, the charity sector, sincerity, you know, keeping a sincere intention. So many uh, discussions we had. Honestly, it was a very insightful uh, discussion that we had today, very up and close and personal, lots of lessons and stories that we can take from it, inshallah. So stay tuned and enjoy this episode. Brother Rahim, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Lovely to have you. Um, a lot of, lot of, uh, none of the viewers know that around three years ago, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we actually sat down virtually. This was yeah. around COVID During time. During COVID, yeah. Yes. And we actually did a full length podcast. We did. But subhanAllah, it got, it got lost. So. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah. Do you know what I thought? Yeah. It's funny. I thought like I must have said something really bad. Like, <laughs> no, I thought, oh my god, what did I do? It never, it never it's turned like up. That. It's nothing like that. And so then you firstly, told me it literally got lost. Yeah, 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 yeah. It got lost. So firstly, our apologies for that. But um, secondly, I was going to say Alhamdulillah because Alhamdulillah. you know what? As they say, there's um, there's khair in delays. Alhamdulillah. So maybe it was meant to be that we're just supposed to yeah, sit. Yeah. In no, front I've got of a few each more grey hairs now. Yeah. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Alhamdulillah. No, great to have you. Um, I think today's one is going to be quite close up and personal. Um, sure. Um, I think so. Uh, and and usually, you know, usually we don't go close up and personal, but I feel like, you know, where there's benefit and we can take lessons um, from so someone's past life and experiences, well, I think, yeah, inshallah, there's, it, it's always a good thing to explore that. Um so I guess I don't know really where to start, but you know, I think mashallah, a lot of people know you as um, the TV presenter, you know, charity fundraiser, seeing you on stage at events. We'll come to that side of your life shortly, but I guess because people see that side of you, naturally people assume, okay, this guy grew up in a Muslim household, grew up as a Muslim, practicing. This was his life the the, the whole the entire time. You know, that, that's a natural assumption that I'm. I take it most people would have, but then subhanAllah they don't know there's this whole story behind mm. all of this, right? Where you come from and, and, and you know, your upbringing. So should we start with uh, young Rahim, um, what your background was growing up, your sense of religion, identity, that kind of thing. Let, let, let's start from there. Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Um, it's really interesting um, because I just, I have kind of like most people, I have so many facets to our identity. Mm -hmm. And that's a real postmodern thing. You know, we're, we're British and we're Asian and we're Muslim and we're in some case millennials. Mm -hmm. And we've got all these aspects of our identity. My identity growing up was definitely not Muslim, but I had a Muslim father. Mm -hmm. So my father was Muslim. May Allah bless him. May Allah forgive him. Um, he's passed away now. He wasn't, he wasn't strict about religion at all. To the extent that he married a non-Muslim mm. and wasn't concerned that my mother was non-Muslim. And my mother was the dominant personality. So growing up in our home, Christmas was the biggest celebration of the year. Yeah. Christmas tree, mm. lights, decorations, turkey dinner, mm. Christmas pre presents under the tree. Santa Claus used to come every year. No way. You know, yeah, yeah, man. I mean, that was like massive Santa Claus. Yeah. I remember, I remember, I was <clears throat> gutted, man, when I found out that he wasn't real. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and in fact, the funny thing is, and I'm sure a load yeah. of non-Muslims would relate to this. I kind of had an inkling that he wasn't real. Do you know what I mean? By the time I got to about nine, eight, or nine, you start okay. to yeah, you start yeah, to get yeah. the vibes, right? That yeah. this guy. Where's, where's the chimney? And is he really coming yeah. down in the middle? But I didn't want to admit it because he brings goods, man. He brings you, he brings the, lo he brings the love, right? <laughs> so he would bring these gifts. Yeah. So, so I didn't want to admit it. But yeah, that was the big thing. The mosque was not a feature. Mm. Um, maybe we would go on Eid. And actually, 
my brother, I didn't, I didn't even look Muslim actually when I was young. I was a little bit fairer, and of course, I didn't have a beard, and I had, mm. I had brown hair, not black hair. And my brother is even fairer than me. He's got like greeny blue eyes. He's whiter than I am. Um, so when we would go to the mosque in those days, there were no non-South Asians yeah. in the mosque. Yeah. So people would stare, <clears throat> and we didn't know what we were doing. All right, and I, I've got to throw this in. There's a funny thing, actually. For some reason, my dad, and that was the only time he would go to the mosque, right? He didn't go for Juma. None mm. of us, I didn't even know what Juma was. Um, and he used to say, Amin loudly. Right. Right. But he was the only person in the mosque that used to say, Amin right, right. loudly. Yeah, yeah. There's and always not, that one. <laughs> yeah. And not only did he say it loudly, yeah. he had this like, it was as if he was making up for the rest of the year that he hadn't been there. Yeah. So he had this super extravagant Amin. Ah, yeah. Like that, right? And he was the only one. And my brother and I, we just used to cringe. We just used to cringe like that. Oh no, they're already staring at us. Yeah, and now yeah. our dad's the only one doing that. So that was, I was more familiar with the inside of a church than I was with the mm. inside of a, no halal food, no juma, uh, no, nothing like that in yeah. our home. But Alhamdulillah, a seed had been planted. I knew that I was given a Muslim name. Yeah. Um, I knew that my brothers and sisters had been given Muslim names. I knew that our family was Muslim. I knew my father was Muslim. I certainly didn't consider myself a Christian. And had I been put on the spot, I would have probably said Muslim. Mm. But in just in that kind of vague, in yeah. that vague way. What I did have was my grandparents. My my uh, grandparents were from India mm. who were religious, alhamdulillah. Okay. And I had contact with them and I had a close relationship with them. And they had a relationship with the Quran and they used to pray. So that I had that kind of connection with Islam, but no formal practice, mm. no formal right. practice at all. Interesting. Alhamdulillah. See. So alhamdulillah, so you had a sense of Islam there somewhere lurking yeah, in the background, yeah. but you yourself weren't. Like many fully... young people, I saw it as a hindrance. Mm. I saw it as something that was there to restrict me, to get in the way, yeah. that really, I didn't really have any belief. Mm. I wasn't interested in it. And it just seemed to be something that was there to stop me having fun. Mm. So by the time, and most of us, we start to form our core identities. You know, the Prophet Muhammad says, said, you know, he said, play with a child until they're seven and then educate them from seven to 14. And about seven, eight, somewhere around there, we start to get our own opinions. Mm. We start to think about the world around us. Um, and, you know, it, I didn't really want to be religious. I didn't want that in my life. I wanted dunya and I wanted mm. the things that everybody else did. I just wanted to have fun, really. Yeah. And and that was that was very prominent through my teenage years, particularly. So I guess uh, the question that a lot of people would have is not having the presence of the parents who are fully, you know, encouraging you, let's just say, to go to the masjid and learn Quran and things like that. Obviously it's difficult um, when you don't have that. So then for you, where where did the spark come from? Because if it wasn't from your parents directly, was it a friend, was it? Uh, Do you know, I'll, I'll come to that. I've just got to share this with you. Yeah, go on. Because there was one moment when we were like, I don't know, about 10, 11 years old, right? Mm. And my dad, he must have had like this guilt trip or something. Or okay. well, I think what had happened is that one of his relatives said, your kids don't know anything about Islam. You've got to send them to madrasa, right? Mm. So my dad came to me and he said, you're going to go to madrasa. I don't know what madrasa was, right? He said, you've got to go to madrasa. You're going to have to learn the Quran and learn to mm. pray and all these things, right? And so we went, my brother and I and my sister, my brother and sister are twins and they're just a year younger than me. And the three of us, we went, okay, to this little local place. And I went in there and we sat down. And my sister didn't have her arms covered, right? She didn't have her arms covered, okay? And the imam, he wouldn't let her in, right? <laughs> so we went back home, right? And told mm. my my mum, my mum was fierce. She was Irish, red-haired, blue-eyed. She was always ready for a fight, my mum, okay? Okay? <laughs> she said, you what? He won't let you, he what? <laughs> he, she, she literally went round to the, to the, it wasn't a mosque, it was in a house, right? Yeah, yeah. She went round and uh. she tore a strip off that imam. I'm telling you, he didn't know what, he must have been thinking, this mad woman has come. And my brother and I, we were like, yeah, we never have to go. We never have to go. <laughs> so we never went. Seriously, you didn't go after Yeah, that. never, wow. never. Oh, no, wow. never went, ever. So the spark really... It happened mm. in my 20s. Okay. So I, I left school uh, at 18. Mm. Um, I, I knew university wasn't for me. Um, I, I never studied at school. I failed all my A-levels. I retook them. I failed them all again. I never opened a book. I didn't do anything. Um, but I was passionate about music. 
and I worked my way into the music business and I worked my, my way up through the music business. And it was going really, really well. And I worked for some of the largest record companies in the world. The, the last one I was working with was Motown Records, which is one of the most famous music brands in, in the world. Um, as, an, as a musician or like a producer? No, or? I was working in A&R, which is um, artists and repertoire, looking for artists. Okay, so okay. Effectively a talent scout, mm. a talent scout. <clears throat> um, a, very, a very, for want of a better word, glamorous lifestyle, you know, uh, kind of, you know, VIP lists and, you know, you can, you can yeah. open or access all areas and all this kind of stuff. And what had happened is that my cousin, who was the closest cousin to me growing up, who also wasn't religious at all growing up, mm. but he, both his parents were from India. So I'm just my father was from India. Both his parents were from India. At the age of 18, he was taken on Hajj. And the funny thing was we used to go on summer holiday every year. Right. And the, the lads, like mm. lads summer holiday, yeah, right? Yeah. We'd all go away on summer holiday and get up to lads things, right? And this year he phoned me and he goes, I, I, I can't come, I can't come. I'm like, what do you mean? It's booked, we're going, man. He's like, my mum says I have to go for Hajj. I phoned, as an auntie, I said, please, <laughs> you don't understand. He has to come with us. The holiday's booked. She's like, no, he's going to go for Hajj. And, and I was like, oh, and he's like, oh, like this. He went for Hajj and Alhamdulillah, it was transformative for him. Now, he was as close to me as a brother. Genuinely, we'd been in the same class together growing up in school. We used to walk to school and back every single day together. So we were very, very close. Mm. I saw this transformation in him, which was profound. It was a profound transformation. Now I knew him, remember, like a brother, I knew him. I knew mm. he wasn't religious. Mm. Yeah. At first, I swear to you, I thought he joined a cult. That's what I thought. I thought he'd been brainwashed, literally, mm. because he changed so much after coming back from Hajj. He got married like a year later. He was 19 or 20. At 20, he had a kid. Now, I'm in the music business and I'm living the life, yeah. you know, in the music business. But as it went on, I had this emptiness, you know, this sense of just what is it about? Mm. Just making money? Just mixing with famous people. Is that it? Is that it? And I had more dunya than I'd expected. Much more. At the age of company cars and expense accounts and all of this stuff. And the sweetness, it only lasted a short time each time. And then you and then you would set your sights on a new target. And then you'd achieve the new target. Motown Records, when I worked for Motown, that was a dream come true. Mm. And then a few months into that, the sweetness of that started to disappear. But when I would meet my cousin, his name's Atif, he had a different level of sweetness. He had a different level of contentment. And it always struck me, and I didn't want to see it. I didn't, I just didn't want to see it, mm. but I could see it. He didn't have money. He was married. He had a kid. He was studying. I remember literally going around to visit him and he was sleeping on the floor on a mattress. I'm like, the guy's got nothing. Mm. But he had a contentment that I didn't have. And he would give me dawah and I wouldn't listen to him. It was, I just, oh, I don't want to hear it. It's, that's how I felt, you know. Um, but slowly, 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 as I got more and more lost and more and more discontent and more and more um, just really almost like a breakdown, I got to that stage where mm. I just didn't know what the point of any of it was. I would see him and his, his cohort and they had this sweetness, they had this contentment, and that had a really big impact <clears throat> on me. And then I did have like a mini breakdown. I really did. Um, and at that point, I remember going home, and I, I did discuss this um, mm. uh, in, another, in another interview I did. I was so lost, and I was convinced that I was losing my mind, actually, in this breakdown. And I made a dua. And I said, to, I said and I didn't even know how to pray, I didn't know how to make dua, I didn't know what I was doing. And I said, God, look, if you're there, I said, if you're there and you want me, I said, I will, I will give up all of the haram in my life for one month. I did this, it was like a deal. I said, I'll give up haram for one month. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, literally, I remember this. I remember where I was sitting. Yeah. I, thought, I can't do a month, man. I can't. It's too long. <laughs> right. So then I said, two weeks. And then I thought, that's not enough, is it? And I bargained with this. Three weeks. Okay, God, I'll give up all the haram for three weeks. Just please don't let me go crazy. Right. 
And of course, after three weeks, I was still crazy. I was still not happy. Mm. But again, that seed had been planted. I opened the Quran. I started reading. I started asking for help. I started wanting to know more about Islam. Alhamdulillah. I was 20, 24, I think, at that time. Alhamdulillah. It's, it's interesting that you talk about contentment, you know, because I think um, we live in a world today where everyone's chasing happiness. Mm. Everyone wants happiness, happiness, mm. happiness. But then, like you said, you start tasting you know, this stage of life and then that doesn't make you happy. You taste something else and that doesn't make you happy. But then as Muslims, I think, I don't think that the pursuit should ever be pursuit of happiness. It should be contentment. Mm. And subhanAllah, that's going to maybe tie in with stuff we talk about later, charity and things like that as well. Um, but I think ultimately as Muslims, maybe that's a lesson, an immediate lesson that I'm taking anyway is instead of chasing happiness, we know that this world is not for happiness. There's always going to be sadness and trial and, and all of these things, right? But at least aim for some level of contentment. Mm. So what, how, would you, how would you define, uh, obviously it's difficult to put into words, but how would you define contentment? You know, I always told my children growing up, I always mm. told them that the dunya is an illusion. Mm. It's an illusion. And especially as many will know, my son Harris, you know, mm. he, you know he was th the dunya was thrown at him in many ways. And, and in a way that's really even more difficult because when you've got people who are your fans, so mm. to speak, it's a, very, it's a very difficult thing on a young ego. And I, I, I would say to him and I would say to his brothers and sisters, I'd say, look, from a dunya point of view, there probably isn't anything greater than having people screaming your name. There probably isn't a higher level than that. But it's empty. It's empty. The minute the screaming stops, you're mm. left abandoned. You're left with nothing. And I would say to them, the only thing that is going to fill your heart is, is, the, is your relationship with Allah. Mm. The Prophet Muhammad said, he put it in his words, you know, the dhikr of Allah. Kids, you know, you say dhikr of Allah, they don't get that so much. But your relationship with your Lord Mm. That is the only thing which is, and I would describe it to them. I said, when Allah created the human heart, I said, it has, it has certain capacities. It has certain characteristics. Mm. The characteristic of the human heart is it has four chambers. The characteristic of the human heart is that it has arteries and veins. The characteristic of the human heart is that it beats. And the characteristic of the human heart as Allah created it is nothing can fill it except that relationship with Allah. Mm. Allah created it. And that's one of the characteristics he put inside it. And if you seek that contentment, mm. if you seek that happiness elsewhere, the heart will, won't, won't accept it. It will just be a temporary fleeting sense of joy. Mm. So what you talk about that contentment, contentment is when the heart is filled with that relationship with Allah. And, and that can be in the good times and the bad times. And that's actually what gets you through the bad times. You know, it gives you a perspective. It gives you a greater meaning. Um, and, and, and the hard times will come. They come for everybody. There's nobody. We know the, prof <coughs> the prophets are tested the most. Yeah. Alayhim No one is tested more than them. So we're going to be tested with, with loss of life and health and wealth and, and all these different things. And the only way we're going to ride that wave of uncertainty and, and get through those tests is through a sense of contentment mm. and that contentment with the Qadr of Allah. And that's key actually. And I used to say that again to my children. I say, you know, the pillars of Iman, some of them are really obvious, but it's that last one that's mentioned, which is, it, it, it has the biggest impact. You know, we believe in Allah and his books and his angels and his prophets and blah, and we believe in Qadr, okay? Mm. The good of it, and the bad of it. What does that mean? None of us, Allahu Alim, very few of us question the good of our Qadr. Mm. We don't sit at home racking our brains. Why was I born in a wealthy country? Ya Allah, why did you give me my limbs? Oh Allah, why did you give me eyes? Oh Allah, why did you give me education? Very few of us question the good of our Qadr. Mm. But Iman, the pillar of Iman, is to accept the bad of our qadr as well, you know, to accept it. And if you accept with acceptance of anything, comes contentment. Mm -hmm. It's when you fight. It's when you fight. In fact, I just met a brother here on the tube, on the way here. He, I bumped into him and he was talking about he, he, lost, he lost the function of his kidneys during COVID. 
and he was on dialysis for three years. And I was asking him, just a random guy, mashallah, Allah bless him. Mubeen, his name was. And we were just talking and he, he was explaining, this is a fitna. He lost his, his sister passed away from COVID. His, his father passed away from COVID. He nearly passed away. Mm. He lost the use of his kidneys. He said, when I found acceptance, he said, when I accepted the test, mm. he said it changed everything. So that acceptance of our, of our so-called bad qadr, we see it as yeah, bad, yeah. but actually <clears throat> often it's good. Mm. That state of acceptance brings with it contentment. It brings with it a peace and a tranquility that you can't get without it. Mm. Fighting, if you're always fighting it, you can't, you'll never yeah, find yeah, yeah. it. So true, subhanAllah. You know, uh, I, as you were speaking, I was reminded of, because um, you mentioned Haris and you mentioned yourself. So there was, uh, you won't remember this by the way. So it was almost 10 years ago, uh, there was an event, Brother Ihsan, Tahmid, he, uh, he yeah, organized yeah, it. Yeah, Allah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like an Ashid event. So I used to do spoken word yeah. right, uh, quite a while back. And uh, you were hosting that event, I remember. And it was one of the first <laughs> times I met you, right? It was about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I must have either just performed or, you know, it was, it, was, it was at the end of the event. I think you saw me. And I can't remember exactly what you said, but I remember the, you, you gave me advice because you said something like, you're a young lad, right? And you're getting a lot of attention. And you mentioned Harris' example as well, your yeah. son's example. And you were like, just, you know, just stay kind of, you know, stay, just, yeah, just... Yeah. Uh, what's the word? Like, you know, kind of just st stay humble, you have right? To, it's difficult. You know, um, don't get too overwhelmed by these things. I just remember, I can't remember exactly what you said, but I remember you giving me a bit, bit of advice. Well, that was like a, a decade ago, right? Um, but it's true. I mean, especially as young people, there's a lot of young viewers, right? And uh, that's why I said everyone's chasing that happiness and they feel like that happiness is going to be found through the fame and nowadays it's social media and views and all of these things, right? But ultimately, anyone who's been there knows that is not going to fill anything in you. That's not going to give you any level of happiness. If anything, it's just going to bring more problems to your table. It um, is. And, and, and it's, going to, it's going to affect your relationship with Allah. Honestly, it's the biggest test. You know, it's, it's an enormous test mm. and, and <clears throat> all of us should fear it. All, of, all the way through our life, we should constantly fear it. The Prophet Muhammad said, beware, beware, beware the hidden shirk, mm. hidden shirk. There are very few people watching who are going to convert to Hinduism or who are going to start b believing that Jesus is the son of God or something. Very, very few of our viewers. But the hidden shirk, and what is the hidden shirk? The Prophet ﷺ said, he said, it is more hidden than the black ant walking on a black rock on a moonless night. Mm. So you can't see it. It creeps up on you. It's impossible to see. And it, it is showing off. It's showing off. It's thinking that I'm special. Yeah. It's thinking that I'm, you know, that that I'm better than others. That I'm, and and this comes when we seek fame. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said, two hungry wolves, let alone in a flock of sheep. And you imagine now, two hungry wolves, mm -hmm. and they're left alone in a flock of sheep. They are going to destroy. They are going to annihilate that flock of sheep. He said they will do less harm than the love. For wealth and status will do on a person's iman, mm -hmm. on our religion. So craving, a craving of a, we are all human. We're all human. We want comfort. We want recognition. There's a level. There's a level. But when it turns into craving, and that was the word the Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. used, a craving for wealth and status, it will destroy our relationship with Allah. It will destroy our, 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 our faith. And that is a constant, constant battle for every single one of us. And we need to be aware. You know, the... These, these these ideas of hypocrisy within us. The, you know, Umar radiallahu anhu, if you think that, that is such a powerful example, I never ever forget it and I remind myself of it all the time. When Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu anhu was given the names of the hypocrites, mm. these are people who wanted the downfall of the Prophet Muhammad. They were fake Muslims. Mm. They were fake Muslims. Umar radiallahu anhu is somebody... The Prophet ﷺ said, if there was a Prophet after me, and I've always wondered about that, why wasn't that Abu Bakr? But just the, the characteristics of Umar radiallahu the Prophet ﷺ said, if there was a Prophet after me, it would have been Umar radiallahu anhu. So you, you can't imagine a status higher than that. When Hudayfa bin Yaman was given the list of the names of the hypocrites, Umar radiallahu ran to him. The narration says, ran. Imagine, you can imagine he's sweating, he's... Is my name on the list? 
it's unbelievable. It's oh. my name on the mm. list. So we always need to be checking our intention. We always need to be checking. And we should fear hypocrisy. The one, the one who says, oh, I'm not a hypocrite. They should fear that. That's, that's you. What do you mean you're not a hypocrite? You know, we should fear hypocrisy, <clears throat> that there's an aspect of hypocrisy within us. The one who says, oh, I, I'm, I'm so humble. SubhanAllah, that's the, like the least humble thing you can say. Mm. You know, we should fear showing off. We should fear these things all the time because shaitan's never going to give up. He's never going to give up misleading us and, mm. and trying to remove our sincerity. Uh, and that's why intention is so important behind everything that we do. It is. Yeah, it is. I mean, since, since, since we're on the topic now, we'll come back to, come back to your story, your background, um, and the story of some of your family as well. But since we're on the topic, I mean, you're someone who is very much in, 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 in the public eye, whether it's on te television, events. I know recently, actually, you were fundraising at uh, the Light Upon Light event. So that's like, you know, huge conferences, Mufti yeah, Bank, yeah, and you have thousands of people, yeah. subhanAllah. And you're on stage, you're fundraising. And for me, subhanAllah, this is one thing I wanted to ask you, because for me, it's like you've got two things, right? On one hand, you've got um, the being in the public eye, the, the, the TV, the presenting, all of that, right, on stage. That's one thing. And on the other hand, you've got the charity aspect, which is that there's, there's charity binded to it. A anything you're doing, it's charity. You're asking for money, et cetera, et cetera. You're raising funds for these causes. Now, what you've kind of done, you've combined the two. So it's like two things which already individually, they're quite, you could say, dangerous, right? When it comes to intentions and mm. things like that. Now you've got both of them together and you're, mashallah, every, almost every day, you know, you've got, you've got something happening. So how do you personally, since we're on the topic of sincerity, niya, intention, how do you how do you tackle that? You know, <laughs> like I said, it's a constant battle, mm. and I don't know if I'm winning. I don't know if I'm winning. Only Allah knows. I don't know what's going to be accepted. Only Allah knows, and we have to have that constant fear. That constant fear that it will not be accepted. That my deeds will not be accepted. That maybe everything I've done, I, I will just be wiped out by a lack of sincerity. And and even even saying this, you know, is there a fake sincerity? And say, you know, it's difficult. It's mm. a difficult journey, yeah, yeah, and we just have to try. But what I remind myself, and I speak to people all the time about this, in in the charity, what I remind myself about all the time is that the and this is this is about charity, but this is about all of our deeds, all yeah. of our deeds. The result is not in our hands. Mm. It's it's natural. If I do an event and we raise a million pounds, yep. it's natural for me as a human to feel like a buzz, mm. to feel success about that. But maybe we did a million pounds because there were, <coughs> there were loads of millionaires in the room and they all just gave money easily and I yeah. had to put no effort in. And then I go to another fundraiser where the people are miskeen and I have to sweat and I have to work and I have to try and we raise 5,000 pounds. Allah, who, where's, the, where's the reward? I don't know. The reward is not with the outcome. The reward is with our effort. And that's what I try to remind myself of all the time. And often I don't even ask. I don't even ask how much we raised because I don't want to be dis... And I make dua. I say, Ya Allah, don't make me disappointed if we raise a little and don't mm. make me excited if we raise a lot. The outcome is with you. Allah, help me to, to do... Help me to just be sincere. Help me to do the right thing. And the, the narration that I remind myself of and I remind my children and I remind fundraisers whenever I speak to them and people who come to me and say, Brother Him, we're doing this and we're doing that and how much can we... Ra I say, listen, listen. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that on the Day of Judgment, his Ummah, the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu will be the biggest Ummah. And then there will be Ummah of Isa Alayhi Salaam and the Ummah of so-and-so and so-and-so and the Prophets. And then he said, some Prophets will come with a handful of followers. You imagine that, mm. a handful of followers. We know from one narration that um, uh, Nuh alayhi salam, who we know gave da'a for 950 years, they say that at that point he had maybe 80 or 90 followers. Mm. That, that's like one every 10 years, okay? So the result, and then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, and some prophets will come without a single follower on the day mm. of judgment. Now, if we're looking at success, how are we going to judge their success by that outcome? Mm. They're the greatest mm. creation of, of all of creation. The first to enter Jannah. The, uh, a status that none of us can even imagine. And after a lifetime, 
a lifetime of calling people, a lifetime of sincerity, a lifetime of da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't reward them with one follower in this dunya, not one follower. <clears throat> How must that have felt? But we don't look at the, the outcome. The outcome is with Allah. The only thing we have control over is our effort. Mm. So in terms of that sincerity or in terms, we have to focus on our effort, not on the outcome. We have to try and not and, and be fixated with the outcome. But think about our effort, what we're going to put into it, because that's where our reward is, inshallah. Mm. Inshallah. inshallah. I'm always reminded of uh, when, whenever we talk about um, the topic of sincerity and especially being in the public eye, um, I'm always reminded of the, the dua, which is attributed to Abu Bakr Adilan, but they say others from the Salaf used to make this kind of dua, which is like, Oh Allah, لا تؤاخذني بما يقولون Oh Allah, do not hold me to account for what they say about me. Yeah. Right, because people are going to say yeah. things, and mashallah, yeah, compliments, yeah, yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah. praise, and all of these things. Yeah. So don't hold me to account yeah. for what they say. And وَغْفِرْ لِي مَا لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And oh Allah, forgive me for what they don't know about me. Yeah. Because they're only seeing the good side. You know, I right? heard a narration the other day, <clears> man. <throat> um, and it's attributed to one of the, I think it's attributed to Hassan al-Basri. Allah forgive me, I'm sure one of our yeah. viewers will know. It's a well-known narration. If my sins had a smell, mm. no one would sit with me. If my sins had a smell, nobody would sit with me. No one would come near me. Yeah. And that's the reality. That's the reality yeah. that we have to keep reminding ourselves of. Whatever people say, they don't know. Mm. They don't know. No one knows. Only Allah knows. Yeah. You know, and that's terrifying. And 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 it's true as well. Imagine yeah, it's true. Imagine yeah. how much uh, I would stink. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the reality, right? You know, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and and the end of that du'a, the last part is, "Wajalni uh, khayram mimma yadunun." Oh Allah, make me better than what they think of. Better me. than what they think of. This me. is this yeah. is this is it. And yeah. for me, that yeah, that that du'a, subhanallah, is, it, it just captures everything. Yeah. Right. Because it's like, don't hold me to account for for the things that they say. At the same time, they don't know a lot about me. At the same time, Allah, make me better uh, than than what they think of me, subhanallah. And um, I mean. And 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 again, there's a, there's another narration I heard, which is uh, one of the one of the salaf. Uh, he said um, that when someone praises you, they are only or if someone is amazed by you, they're only amazed by how well Allah has covered you. Yeah, exactly. So like, exactly. It's amazing, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's Absolutely. it. Like Allah, it's only know. Allah has covered us. That's yeah, why yeah. you see the good side yeah. of me. Otherwise, if yeah. Allah wanted, He would have shown yeah, the yeah. reality, like yeah. you said. Yeah, I mean, look, again, it's difficult to speak about these things without <clears throat> sounding yeah, like you're showing yeah, yeah. off and whatever. But I make a dua all the time. I try to make a dua before every event and before every time I go on an appeal or before any public appearance. Yeah. Allah, don't humiliate me. Because you could just reduce me and humiliate me in front of these people and I'm, I could be nothing. Mm. Just like that. Just like that. So please don't humiliate me. Please. And it's only from you that the goodness comes. Yeah. It's only from Allah that goodness comes. And we try. We, we, you know, we, none, we, we don't know what's accepted. We just don't know what's accepted. Exactly. And we can just try. And as I said, we got to keep that awareness that we might be bankrupt. We mm. might be bankrupt when we That's stand it. before Allah. Nothing might be accepted. Yeah. The three first people to enter the hellfire, mm. dragged on their faces. Who were they? They were all people in the public domain. Yep. All of them. Yep. The, the Mujahid, who was the great Mujahid, and everyone called him that dra because he wasn't sincere. The one who used to give all his money in charity because everyone praised him for it. He wasn't sincere. And the scholar or the one of Quran, who used, and everyone knew him for that. They got their, they got their praise in this world. Mm. Because the hadith says, and they were known for it. Exactly. But because they weren't sincere, they were the first people dragged in the hellfire. May Allah protect us. I mean, I mean. I mean. Um, so what, what actually got you into, into this, this, oh, man. Allah, this sector, know? charity, fundraising, yeah. presenting? Yeah, yeah. How did you get so, into that? So look, if people know anything about Irish people, we've, Irish people have got what something's called the gift of the gap, right? Mm. Irish people, the blarney, they call it, right? <laughs> they can, we can talk all day, yeah? Sure. I've always been a talker, yeah? Okay. At school, I was always the one entertaining everybody and I was yeah. the center of the social circle. Not, be, not, not because I deserve to be, but because I was always the one, I was the mm. big mouth. Yeah, I was always the big <laughs> mouth, okay? Um, but I never had any, I didn't know, I never, I never spoke in public. I never went in front of a camera until I was, I think, 34 or 35 years old. I was working in mental health services. I was working as a social mm. worker. I was in, but when Islam Channel got started in 2004, um, I was contacted by the head of Islam Channel. 
And I don't know why. I thought, I actually genuinely thought it was a case of mistaken identity. I thought, how does he know me? And this was before Muhammad Ali, may Allah bless mm. him, who owns it now. There was another brother running it at the time. And uh, he said, uh, why don't you come and do some work with Islam? And I was thinking, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know anything mm. about TV. I don't know. And he asked me to make a TV. And I thought, I, I thought he got the wrong person, right? So I went home to my wife and I said, why are they asking me? I don't know anything about TV. I don't know how to present. Yeah. And my wife, may Allah bless her, she said to me, you're always talking. She said, you're always, she said give it a go, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And I said, yeah. all right, okay, I'll give it a go. And I gave, literally, I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what a producer or an editor or a director or a cameraman, I didn't. Yeah. But I did believe that I could communicate. I knew, well, I knew, alhamdulillah, I could communicate. I've always been a communicator and I knew that. Mm. Would it come through the camera? Allah alim. Anyway, they said to me, Islam Channel said to me, look, here's a cameraman and a sound man for a weekend. See what you come up with. And that was the beginning. It was just literally Qadrullah. I hadn't planned it. I didn't, I didn't know. And the same with fundraising. In fact, the first time I ever saw a fundraiser, I used to be like on the tours. I was the guy who did the driving mm. and the food and the accommodation yeah, for the yeah. shayukh, right? Mm. When they used to come, I was behind the scenes, okay? And used to look after the sheikhs and drive them around and whatever. And I saw a fundraiser. I remember the first one I saw. And I turned to my cousin who was with me and I said, God, I don't have to do that. Oh man, thank God I don't have to do that. Yeah. Because it's that off, you know, everyone knows it. That moment you're yeah. asking for the hands and no one's putting their hand up and you're sweating and, mm. and you that, there's that dynamic between you and the crowd. And I said, literally, thank God I don't have to do that. Mm. So I never, ever intended to be a fundraiser. I never wanted to be a fundraiser. And even now I still feel that awkwardness and that cringiness. I'm grateful to Allah. I'm grateful. Mm. And, the, and I'm reminded by a friend of mine who's a fundraiser that the Prophet Muhammad was a fundraiser mm. it's from his sunnah mm. he used to ask people not for himself clearly he used to ask people for uh, for a cause to to donate um, so alhamdulillah but really I never planned mm -hmm. it I never knew and and I remember the first time I remember and this is a this is just a general message here to young people or anyone who's watching we have to push ourselves outside our comfort zone all of us have amazing abilities at something, at yeah. something. Everybody is amazing at something, okay? But you won't find out by just staying inside your comfort zone the whole yeah. time. You've got to push yourself <clears throat> outside your comfort zone to see, excuse me, to see what you're capable of, to see what you can do. I will never forget the first time they put me live on Islam channel, right? I was sweating at home for I think three days, mm. right? I was, they asked me to host the show, right? For three days, I had never hosted a show. I'd never been on live TV in my life, okay? And I got it into my head. I got this monster that grew in my head, right? That when we went live, I was going to freak out and have a panic attack, right? Mm. That's what I thought. And it became a monster in my head. I can tell you, man, I must have a hundred times thought of phoning and cancelling, Right? but I pushed myself outside mm. that comfort zone. And I'm telling you, when that voice was in my ear, because we got little earpieces yeah, yeah. on live TV, yeah? <laughs> when that voice was in my ear going, and we're going live in five, four, three, my heart must have been beating at about 200 beats a minute. <laughs> I'm telling you, right? That first time, yeah, yeah. okay? But when you push yourself, when you put in whatever area of your life, you push yourself outside your comfort zone, particularly in charity, and we can mm. come back to that if you want. When you push yourself outside your comfort zone, things happen. You see what you're capable of. Mm. And, and this, is, this is the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ihsan. Mm. You don't get Ihsan by just kicking back and taking it easy. This, eh, eh, for want of a better word, Ihsan would be excellence. Mm. Or, 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 or well, excellence, I think, is probably the best yeah. word. You know, you don't find excellence without pushing yourself. The early generations, they all pushed themselves. They pushed themselves in their salah and in their deen and in their dunya and in their family life to be the best that they could be. You don't get that by just chilling and sitting back and, and resting on your laurels. Exactly. Yeah, and 100%, uh, you know, we talk about this, to be honest, all, all episode, but it's something that I believe in. Honestly, it's pushing yourself. You know, I, what, what, I, what I tell young people, we're all young, alhamdulillah, but, you know, younger, 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 younger people is... Uh, Especially those years you've got now, it's just experiment. Like you know, try different things. Yeah. Because uh, if you don't try things, you, you just won't. And 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 like networking, going out, speaking to people, uh, building relationships. 
um, trying things like, you know, the TV thing you mentioned. You, you never, you would just never know what you're good at. And some things you're going to do. And at the end of it, you'll say, you know what? I never want to do that again. That's fine. At yeah, least you've tried it. Exactly. Other things you'd be like, wow, I didn't know I was, I was good at that. Even the whole, um, this podcasting it came about because again, it's a very similar story to yourself. I was pushed into yeah. doing uh, some TV presenting once, just, just presenting a show. Like, same experience as you. Countdown. Yeah, I wasn't briefed. I don't know what I was doing. I we, we, were you as scared as I was? I was very scared. Well, <laughs> and, and I was a lot younger than you were as well. Yeah. You can imagine when, when I did. I was much younger. Yeah. I don't know what I was doing. To be honest with you, um, but I actually really enjoyed it. And I was like, you know, I I like having conversations with people, and I like you know meeting new people, finding yeah. their stories. So this is what led to the podcast. And you yeah, know, yeah. you just never know. Subhanallah. What, and there's certain things I did when I was a bit younger. Which I'll be honest with you is just I failed epically. Yeah, uh, and that's okay because I can look back and be exactly. like, okay, I learned I learned X Y Z from exactly. it. Exactly. Um, but I feel like you know, uh, it's exactly what you said, Brother Rahim, which is maybe some of the young younger Muslims today, they're a bit too comfortable. They don't want to get out of the comfort zone. They want to go the, the kind of easy route. But I think yeah, if you really want to create some kind of you know, and we should be aiming to to make more of a difference and impact. I think you need to try different things. Don't box yourself in, I guess, to yeah, to one and, area. And and keep going. Yeah. What I've seen, you know, now I'm in my 50s, okay? Mashallah. And what you see is, you see, I've got now a perspective where I can remember some of the heads of organisations within the Muslim community. I remember when they were volunteers. Mm. I remember when they were volunteers in those organisations, fresh-faced, just out of university or just out of college, and they were volunteering. And, and now they're heading up those organisations. Yeah. You know, you keep going, keep going, keep going. And as you said, your networks develop, your, your, and suddenly you're an expert. Mm. You don't realize it happens, you know. Suddenly you're an expert and people are coming to you and asking you for advice. Sir. But again, it's always about pushing. It's about pushing and, and keeping that intention sincere. If yeah. you're just pushing because you just want to be rich and you just want to, maybe you'll get that. Maybe, maybe you'll get that, but you ain't going to get the sweetness that comes with it. Mm. Push yourself for a, for a more noble cause, whatever that may be. And that can be something simple, providing for my family. Yeah. It can be something simple that I want to, I want to, I want money so that I have time, <clears throat> so that I don't have to work as hard when I'm a little bit older because then I'm going to spend time studying the deen yeah. or getting. It can be many, many reasons, you know, it can be many, many reasons, mm. but not just because I want money in dunya. That's yeah. never, you, you're just going to be chasing for the rest of your life. Exactly. It's, a, it's like chasing <clears throat> your shadow, isn't it? You never exactly. catch it. You yeah, never yeah. catch it. Those goalposts always, always, always move. And, and everybody, who's listening will know that phenomenon that you wanted that new phone and there was a buzz when you got that latest model of that latest phone and you loved it and it was amazing and within weeks or months you, your target has changed your your eyesight or the latest car or a house or whatever that aspect of the dunya may be you know yeah. if it's just the dunya you were chasing you're just going to keep chasing yeah exactly um I, again i think we could do probably a separate episode i was going to ask you about just the stories that you've probably come across being involved in the charity sector and, you know, whether it's with, with people who have donated or people's lives have changed or the, I think that's just another episode in and of itself. Is there anything that comes to mind? Do you know what? So, I'm going to just bring you one quickly. Yeah, go I on. mean, there's, uh, there's one that I've done, which many people would have seen, which is um, a, a miracle in my life. And I'm not going to go into it now because of time. A miracle where after the 2014 Gaza campaign, I gave a donation outside my comfort zone, mm. way, way outside mm. my comfort zone in terms of how much it was. I just felt something in my heart. Allah guided me and I gave this donation. That donation saved my life. I'm almost certain that that donation mm. saved my life. The Prophet Muhammad said, awesome. he said, say, he said, he said, he said, give sadaqah for it will shield you from calamity. And he added, he said, without delay. And when he said without delay, for me, the way I read that is that the calamity it's on its way to you. It's heading towards you. That's why he said without delay. Mm. It's on its way. There's a calamity coming in your qadr. But part of your qadr, inshallah, is that you're going to push yourself, you're going to give charity, and it's going to shield you mm. from that calamity. And I was shielded. My life was saved after a car accident by, by um, a sadaqah that I gave. But something re re recent that happened. I was with two of the two of the most uh, prolific campaigners for Gaza at the moment, Sean King and uh, and Khalid Baydoun. Mm. And I was, and may Allah bless both of them and guide them, inshallah, and give them the best of this life and the next. Amen. Amen. Uh, profound voices, outspoken, millions and millions of followers, campaigning for years on human rights and specifically for Gaza. And I was I was on a tour with them and a little bit of fundraising where no one wants to see me. <laughs> come on in the middle and they're like oh not him again right um and we did the fundraising and alhamdulillah it went very well and afterwards a sister came up to me 
And she said, Brother Him, I didn't want to put my hand up. I wanted to go. She goes, Look, my husband and I, we've been saving up for a house. She said, and we've saved our stamp duty. Now, if it's, we're in London. If you live in London and you know about buying houses, stamp duty in London is going to be, that was, they already have a house, by the way. So they were upgrading a house. Yeah. I don't know the amount. It's going to be five figures, whether that's 10,000, 20,000, something. Mm. Allahu alam what the figure was. I didn't ask her. But she said, we've been saving up and we gave our stamp duty today. We gave it for the people of Gaza. And... She didn't want to put her hand up. And she said, look, we've already got a house. Mm. They've got nothing. So she's, she's effectively sacrificing her house, right? And I was, I was so, she goes, don't tell everyone. To, I said, okay, I won't mention you by name. I went back on stage. I'd finished the fundraising and they were already sick and tired of me. And I had to go back on. I said, look, guys, I just want to share this. I'm not going to point them out. There's a, a, a husband and wife here. They gave their stamp duty for the people of Gaza. Ya Allah, provide for them. Uh, we asked everyone to make dua. Ya Allah, provide for them. Give them good work. I came off stage. Immediately, a guy comes up to me. He goes, I'm a surveyor. Uh, I'm a property surveyor. He goes, whatever they need for their pro it's free from me. So they've saved thousands of pounds there mm. straight away, right? Mashallah. Mashallah. The sister DM'd me on my Instagram four or five days later. And she goes, Brother Rahim, I hope you remember I was sister so and so. I said, How can I forget? She goes, Brother, we had so much difficulty conceiving, you cannot imagine. It took us years. She said, And I've just found out I'm pregnant. Allah Akbar. And this is. These are the miracles when you push yourself in sadaqah, you push yourself outside your comfort zone. The miracles happen in front of your eyes. And of course, we can't promise anyone they're going to get pregnant or they're going to, illness is going to be cured. I was going to write a book years ago. And for me, that is like, I can't tell you what a, what a difficult thing that is because I hated studying. I hated, I loved school because I was always messing about, but I hated school in terms of studying and writing and all of that. And the idea of writing a book to me feels like, um, I'm climbing Mount Everest, right? But I was going to write a book and I still have the intention somewhere and some brother said he'd publish it for me. And it's a simple book called The Miracles of Sadaqah. And it is literally just the stories people have told me since mm. I've been involved in this work. So I, hundreds of stories like that that people have told me, calls that have come in on Islam Channel, people at events. I, I went into an event recently and I was late. I was running late for the event and there was hundreds of people there and I'm the only one not there and I'm hosting the event. And I ran in and a sister grabbed me. She stopped me. She said, Brother Aim. I said, no, sister, sister, I've got to go on stage. She said, no. And she was a bit older than me. She was yeah, auntie. Yeah. I, said, no. she said, I have to tell you this. I have to. I said, okay, auntie, what is it? Quickly, please. I'm, I'm supposed to be on stage. She said, she said, I phoned you recently. This was a few Ramadans ago. She said, I phoned you and I gave a donation. She said, and I pushed myself in that donation. She said, and the audience made dua that Allah would bring my family back together again. She said, 20 years I haven't spoken to my daughter. And this week, my daughter and I are reunited. Sure. Alhamdulillah, these are, this is sadaqah. These are the miracles of sadaqah. Mm. And, and I don't know if you wanted to go down the path of sadaqah now, but I'm going to share this. In Ramadan, each and every one of us, we do a bit more praying, we do a bit more sadaqah, we do a bit more ibadah, inshallah, right? And it's that time when most of us will find space in the night to pray in a way that we don't the rest of the year. Mm. Some of us do when we're in desperate situation, but in Ramadan, it's that special, the night yeah. prayer. It's part of Ramadan. Mm. And we make dua with a sincerity, with a, with a passion, with a belief that we don't in the rest of the year. And we cry and, are, and, and we beg Allah for whatever it is. Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, linked everything that we pray for back to charity. This, I realized this over the years. Everything we pray for. You think of anything, whatever you pray for, whatever the producer here prays for, whatever the brothers and sisters listening at home pray for, I guarantee you that thing that you're praying for and I don't mean in a vague way, in a specific way, is related back to charity. Some examples. Who's, who in Ramadan is going to pray for forgiveness? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, your charity will wash away your sins like water extinguishes fire. So forgiveness comes with our charity. Who isn't afraid of the day of judgment? Who's not afraid of the hellfire? And who is not going to be asking in Ramadan, protect me. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, even if you just have half a date, which means... In, in our vernacular, almost meaningless, almost a worthless amount of charity, one pound. He said, give it because it will save you from the fire. Mm. 
Who is it that doesn't fear the day of judgment standing before Allah, the sun and the heat and the accountability? The Prophet Muhammad said, he said, your sadaqah will be your shade on the day of judgment. Who is it that isn't suffering with fitna in their family, catastrophes and tests in their family? As I mentioned earlier, the Prophet Muhammad said, save yourself from calamities, shield yourself from calamities with your sadaqah. Give it now, don't delay. Who doesn't have illness? Who isn't praying in this Ramadan for the sickness or the illness of somebody in their family, their children, their mother, their brother, their sister? The Prophet Muhammad said, cure your sick with your sadaqah. Whatever, whatever it is. What about our, who, isn't, who doesn't ask for rizq? Oh Allah, increase my rizq, give me, put blessing in my rizq. The, Allah says in the Quran, give in sadaqa, I, Allah, Rabbul Alameen, lahuma fis wal ard, who owns everything in the heavens and the earth. I will multiply your wealth. I will multiply when you give in sadaqah. So everything that people, I can't think of a thing that people pray for mm. that isn't related by the Prophet Muhammad SAW or by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself back to sadaqah. And this is why the Prophet SAW said, as to Burhan. Mm. Your charity is the proof of our faith. It is a living proof of Iman. You can't fake giving away your money. Mm. You can't. Okay, maybe showing off by raising your hand sometimes and we ask Allah to protect us. But by actually giving away your money and losing that money that's in your bank account, you can't fake that. That money's gone. Mm. Right? That's a sadaqah to Burhan. A charity is the proof of our faith. Yeah, subhanAllah. There's, there's, there's a lot there to take, subhanAllah. Um, Brother Reem, we're coming to the end, but I, w I did want to kind of circle back almost to... Um, your, your story and, and, and the background that you were sharing earlier on, um, to then kind of extending it to, to family, because obviously, <clears throat> alhamdulillah, you kind of re-embraced, you could say, Islam again, brought that back into your life, brought a lot of changes into your life, and then even got heavily involved in Islamic you know, activities and the, in, in, this, in, in the Muslim scene, alhamdulillah. So a lot of things changed, mashallah. Um, but then with family, because you mentioned, subhanAllah, you know, your father was you know, Muslim, you could say, uh, your mother was not uh, Muslim. Um, so I just wanted to find out because you've got you've got a story. Obviously, I already know the story, but I really would love our viewers to, to hear the story from you, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, this is the greatest miracle of my life. Alhamdulillah. The greatest miracle of my life. And my family is really mixed, by the way. So my sister, may Allah guide her, she's not Muslim. Uh, although the whole Gaza thing has really started to turn her heart and we ask mm. Allah to turn her Ameen. heart inshallah and I, I know there's iman in <clears throat> her heart alhamdulillah may Allah guide her Ameen. my big brother he's not Muslim he considers himself an atheist um, um, my father-in-law is Jewish and he's actually Zionist Jew so that's a, that's a whole wow. another conversation wow. we have to manage that relationship mm. um, and we do we manage the relationship alhamdulillah my mother was was vehemently against religion vocally passionately against religion okay. so not even neutral on the subject not even she thought it was hip hypocrisy she thought it was falsehood mm. she thought it was brainwashing to the extent that when i started to practice it, it was a big fitna in our life it affected our relationship for quite a few years because right. my wife mm. My wife, who I knew before my days of practicing, didn't wear hijab, and then she started wearing hijab. My my mum thought that was stupid. My mum thought I was stupid. But growing a beard was stupid. Praying mm. was stupid. Even she used to get annoyed sometimes when she'd hear us giving salams. She'd be annoyed by it. And if I was praying in a room and I'd hear the door open behind me, I, I knew the response. It was going to be, oh God, so it would mm. be like that. Okay. So, the thought of and there's a couple of lessons here really. The thought of my mother accepting Islam was like impossible. But like any son, I used to make dua. I used to make dua, Ya Allah guide my mother, Ya Allah guide my mother, Allah guide my mother, Islam. And as the years went by, maybe it was 10 years, maybe it was 15 years, I don't know. I realized, not consciously, I realized I'd stopped making that dua. Because it was impossible. Mm. She wasn't any closer, she was further away, if anything. So I'd stopped making the du'a. As I said, not consciously, just when you don't feel your du'as being answered, eventually you kind of give up, which is a weakness of our iman. And I was in, I think my memory is I was in Masjid al-Quba. I was on Umrah anyway. And I just had this realization. I just, it just came over me. Allah can do anything. Just because I think it's impossible for my mother to accept Islam, which I did, mm -hmm. it's not impossible for Allah. So I've, I've, I should resume, and I resumed with a new, with a new intensity and with a new level of certainty, 
that Allah could do whatever he wanted. Anyway, my mother got ill, she got cancer, she recovered from the cancer. She, then she got ill again. And it was just Qadrullah that I was the one who was in hospital visiting her. Just happened to go and visit her. There was nobody else there at the moment she was told that she was going to die. It was just me and her sitting there. And the doctor came and my mum was a nurse. So she was, she was always very straightforward. She was like, tell me doctor, straight. And he said, it's not good like that. And she was, she was healthy. It was, it, was a, it was like a ton of bricks landing on us. She was healthy at that time. She just had mm. some minor issues. There was no talk of the cancer coming back. There was no talk of her being ill. She was walking and driving and shopping and acting normally, right? Mm. And he said, it's not good news. And she said straight, she said, how long? How long have I got? And my sister was pregnant at the time. And this was in uh, July. And the baby was due in December. So we're talking about five months, six months. She said, will I see my grandson? And he goes, I don't think so. Said, and I couldn't believe it. I'm sitting there. What do you mean? She's healthy. He said, I think we're talking weeks rather than months. It's like, what are you talking about? Mm. Anyway, so I'm sitting there. He, he moved away. Just me and my mum sitting there. He's just told her she's going to die in a matter of weeks. What do you say? She doesn't believe in Allah. She doesn't believe in the Day of Judgment. She doesn't believe in Qadr. She doesn't believe in tests. She doesn't believe in the Akhirah. She doesn't, doesn't believe in anything. What am I, what am I going to say? Have sabr. Oh, it could be. Uh, I was just lost. I didn't have anything to say. Mm. And then, alhamdulillah, Allah inspired me. And I couldn't use words like hadith or the prophets. Or something. I couldn't use that with my mom. She wouldn't listen. I said, look. I said, we have a, a, a narration. I said, a story. I said, we have a story. I said, it speaks about a, a person who was traveling and they sat down underneath a tree to rest. And when they rested, they got up and they left and they carried on on their journey. I said, that story tells us that this life is just that moment of rest and that we're just moving on to another part of our journey. And I thought she was going to say, don't give me your nonsense, right? And she goes, oh, I like that. She goes, I quite like that. So we came home and she started telling and, and the news had gone around the family. Everyone was calling Auntie Moira's gonna die. And, she's, and, and she was a very popular person in our family, mashallah. And, and she just kept saying, no, don't worry. I'm on a journey. Rahim told me there's a journey and uh, I'm just gonna move on to the next. And, and she looked very peaceful with this idea. Then my cousin, the same cousin I mentioned earlier who'd, mm. who'd, who'd, who'd become religious, he had a sign off on his emails. And he was very close. He grew up in our house. So he was very close to my mum. And the sign off on his emails was from George Bernard Shaw. And if anyone doesn't know, George Bernard Shaw spoke amazing words about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So much so you'd think he was Muslim. About him being the saver of humanity. And the, and it had this sign. And my mum called me. She said, Dad, did you? and George Bernard Shaw was Irish. My mum was Irish. She said, did you see this? What George Bernard Shaw said about the Prophet Muhammad. I said, yeah, I know. He said, ah, now everyone's visiting her. She's saying, oh, I'm just on a jet. And did you see? She said, did you see what the... I'm thinking, this is weird, man. I'm not expecting my mum. Anyway, so, the, so, so something had changed in her heart already. But the key moment was this. She called me and she said, look, I need to have a difficult conversation with you. And now we're probably a week, 10 days, something like that away from her, her death. And we didn't know exactly when it was going to be, but we knew she was ill. Yeah. She said, I've told your brother and sister, I want to be cremated and I want you to respect my wishes. And I said, okay. I said, you know, that's your wish. That's what you're going to do. I said, that's what you want done. And I knew, and she said, look, I've asked them to take care. She said, I know that's going to be difficult for you. She said, but I do want you to respect my wishes. And I said, okay, what, what can I do? But I knew my mum. I knew my mum. And I said to her, I said, can we just talk through this? She goes, what do you mean? I said, well, look, let, if you're cremated, no problem. I said, how's it going to happen? Let's just think of it uh, logically. What's going to happen strategically? I said, if you die here at home, and we hope you'll die at home, surrounded by your family, Allah knows. I said, some undertakers are going to come and take your body away. I said, who are they? She looked at me. I said, just some strange men. I said, they're going to carry you out. I said, then they're going to undress you. I said, then they're going to pump you full of chemicals to preserve your body. She knows she's a nurse. She knew about you have to be preserved. Or else you... I said, then they're going to leave you in a, a storage facility for like two weeks. Then they're going to dress you. And my mother, my mum was very modest. She never used to wear mm. makeup. She, I said, they're going to put makeup on your face. They're going to put you in a dress. This is what, this is what happens when you cremate. And, and then I said, they'll bring you into the church or into the place. I said, I said, who are these people? What's, and she said, she said, what's the alternative? 
And I said, I said, your sons. I said, I said, your sons will carry you. Oh, just one sec. I said, your sons will carry you out. I said, and we'll take, I couldn't say mosque. I said, and we'll take you to a local center. I said, your dignity and your, your dignity and your modesty will be preserved at all times. And I said, your daughters will wash you. I said, your daughters will wash you and they will prepare you. I said, and nobody will see you apart from your loved ones. I said, and you'll be wrapped in a simple white cloth and you'll be buried on the same day. And she goes, that's what I want. She goes, that's what I want. And, and she phoned my brother and sister and to their credit, she phoned them and she goes, she said, oh, I've been speaking with Rahim and I've decided I want a Muslim burial, right? Now they, I cannot imagine how shocked they must have been because they, mm. everyone knows my mum. She was yeah. miles away, right, from Islam. Um, to my, their credit, they were like, no problem. As, as I said, no problems. That's what you want. That's what you want. No problem. We, we had a very pluralistic way of our family, you know, being so mixed. We all accept each other's ways. And they said, no problem if that's what you want. Now my problem is she's not Muslim. Mm. <laughs> okay. So uh, she's, mashallah, she's agreed to a Muslim funeral, which I'm really happy about, but she's not Muslim. Who, how can I go to the imam and say, can we do janaza please for my mum and bury her in the Muslim graveyard and do, and, and, and do the ghusl and she's not Muslim. Yeah. So now I've got, I don't know how many days and there's people coming to visit and there's people leaving and, and I, I needed to have this conversation with my yeah. mum. You want a Muslim burial, but you're not Muslim. Okay. So I was in and out and, and every time guests would leave, I would just, but then she would be un, either unconscious or she'd wake up. And it was like, it was the whole, every day felt like, oh my God, am I going to get a chance to talk to her? And I got a chance to talk to her and because she was a nurse, I said to her one day, I said, look, have you ever looked at the body, the human body, how miraculous? Because she was always going on about how miraculous the human, I said, is it possible? And I'm, I'm hoping she's not going to say no. I said, is it possible that there was a designer that somebody created us. It didn't just happen by chance. And you, can you imagine? I'm waiting to think. She, if she says, no, of course not. It's just, that she went, yeah, yeah. She goes, I, 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 could, I, could, I could accept that. I left it there. I'm thinking, okay, she's, in a way she's accepted that there's a creator. Yeah. Then um, and mm. a, a day went, two days, I don't know how long. I went back and I said, um, I said, you know, we're talking about God, that there could be a creator. I said, do you think it's possible that he may have sent righteous people to give us guidance, you know, like, uh, like Jesus and like Muhammad and like that, right? <clears throat> Again, I'm hoping she's not going to say, ah, don't give me your nonsense. She went, yeah, I do. I, I do believe that now. Now, for me, <clears throat> I was thinking that's enough. If I ask her to give shahada and she says, no, I'm snookered, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm checkmated. Mm. Okay. At least now I can say, yeah, alhamdulillah, she said she believes in God. She said she believes in the prophet. Bismillah, Allah can judge her, right? I went downstairs, I told my wife, yeah? And my wife said, oh, it's amazing. And my son Harris was there. And he said, it's not enough. I said, what do you mean? He goes, she has to give her shahada. I said, no, I said, if you got, he goes, he goes, go. and he had a very close relationship with my mum. He was the eldest grandchild. And he went upstairs. He must've been up there. I don't know how long he was up there. To me, it felt like all day, but I think he was up there for maybe an hour, part of an hour. Man, I was walking around and I was, pulling my and I was sweating and I didn't know he's going to come down and say no but she won't because then now now I know for sure he came down I said what I said what what he goes yeah I said what what yeah because yeah but she gave shahada Allah. alhamdulillah alhamdulillah now there were people I'm just going to finish on this and I, I want this I want this on the public record there were people who I love dearly who felt that she'd said this to appease my son because she had a really close relationship with him. He knew she was dying. Mm. She said this to appease my son. Before she passed away, Alhamdulillah, a couple of things happened which showed what was in her heart. She was unconscious. Her doctor came to the house. He woke her up. How are you? She looked up at him and she said, what's your name? And he said, I'm Dr. Muhammad. And she said, she said, why, why aren't you giving me salams? Said, That's what she said to him. Why, why aren't you giving me salams? She said, Salamu alaikum to him like that, right? She never used to say that, right? 
Then my sister-in-law, who was also concerned that she'd only said it, because my sister-in-law's Muslim, I was concerned, was taking my mum to the bathroom. And my mum, she could just about walk, her eyes were closed, and she was using my sister-in-law to lean on it. And my sister-in-law said to her, he said, Mummy, we used to call her Mummy, he said, Mummy, you know that thing you said with Al-Harith? You know, you said, you know, those words, those Arabic words, and, and you said that you believe. Did you just say that, you know, because it's, it's Harris? And she said, she stopped, she opened her eyes, she said, I'm seeing things clearly now. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that is the, the greatest miracle of my life. Alhamdulillah. And you know, and, the, and the, don't give up du'as, people. No matter what it is, no matter how impossible it seems, no matter how far away or unlikely or unimaginable, nothing is impossible for Allah. Nothing is impossible for Allah. So never give up making du'a. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah, there's a, there's a lot of lessons that we can take from that, I think. Sorry like for you all said. the tears, I know. No, do you no, know no, what? No. I get so embarrassed every time. I said it to you last time. When we filmed it last time, I was crying <clears> for <throat> half of it. No, and no, I said, I get so embarrassed. And SubhanAllah, uh, no, there's so many lessons that we can take from it. To be honest, and one of the, one of the key ones you mentioned, which is du'a. Um, du'a, man. The power du'a of du'a. Du'a can, can change, honestly, anything. Like, like you mentioned, the sister who uh, gave sadaqah and she was, you know, hadn't yet conceived and... You know, she she must have been making a lot of du'a for for a child. Allah gave her that, you know, guidance. Um, you know, people are going through difficulty. Even even Gaza, subhanAllah, you know, sometimes we think, I know. What's my du'a? I know. What am I gonna to, do? Yeah, what's my du'a yeah. compared to what's happening out yeah, there? Yeah. Uh, who am I? Like who you knows? just never know. Who knows? One du'a from one person at the right time with the right sincerity could change everything. You never know. Allah, yeah. nothing is impossible for Allah. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. So, du'a and you know, guidance and all of these stories, subhanAllah, I think there's there's so many lessons we can take from it. But um, no, thank you for sharing the story. Alhamdulillah. 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 And, uh, all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. Alhamdulillah. You know, just on that last point, du'a, <clears throat> you know, uh, Sheikh Yasir says, Sheikh Yasir Qadi and others, if we're not waking up in the last third of the night, mm. if we're not waking up in the last third of the night, th this is a time that we're guaranteed that our du'as will be answered. Okay? If we're not waking up in the last third of the night and making dua to Allah in the darkness on our own at that time before Fajr, we don't really care. Because Allah is giving us on a plate. And if we're not taking it, it means we don't really want it. You're not it. desperate enough. We're not desperate. You don't really, you want, don't really it. want it because it's there. So dua is the, is the, is the answer. Yeah. Subhanallah. Uh, well, there's, uh, there's a lot more we can talk about. I know. Time does not permit, I told you, man, but, I can talk uh, all day, man. No, it's it's been. We, it's we been could like, do a five-hour podcast. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, telling we, you, and we should. We should definitely a part two, inshallah. <laughs> definitely a part two of many uh, other. I'll things. I'll send every listener to sleep. It'll be it'll become you know it'll be one of those uh, yeah. sleep sleep hypnosis uh, <laughs> pod thing you put on to when you need to sleep <laughs> and you can't fall asleep. Zakla khair. Allah bless you. Allah bless you and your family. Well, uh, Amen. Uh, all of us. Yeah, all of us. Best, all, all of our viewers. Zakla khair. And thank thanks to Umfeed for all the stuff you guys do, man. Amazing. Amazing. What you guys do, may Allah increase you in sincerity, increase you in success and allow it to be a reason for you, your loved ones, all those you care about, inshallah, to have the good of this life and the next. Ameen. 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 Ameen.